English test has three parts, and in each part, you hear a number of different extracts. At the beginning of the test, you will hear a beep sound. You have time to read the questions before you hear the extracts. You will hear each extract once only. You have to complete your answers as you listen. At the end of each test, you will be given two minutes to check your answers. Part A. In this part of the test, you hear two different extracts. In each extract, a health professional is talking to his patient. For questions 1 to 24, complete the notes with the information you hear. Now, look at the notes for extract 1. Extract 1. Questions 1 to 12. You hear a doctor talking to a patient. For questions 1 to 12, complete the following notes with a word or short phrase. You now have 30 seconds to look at the notes. Hello, doctor. Good morning. Good morning. May I know your problem? Well, I'm having asthma and facing difficulty in walking even 10 steps. My weight is 344 pounds. I have high cholesterol and high blood pressure. I have joint pain, back pain, foot and ankle pain, and swelling on my leg and foot. I have sleep apnea and snoring. Moreover, I am a diabetic patient on medication. I also have hemorrhoids, doctor. I am also pursuing surgical attempts for weight loss and to become active in my life again. What's your age? 37, doctor. Okay. Do you drink or smoke? I do smoke, and I have stopped drinking alcohol a year back. Have you undergone any surgeries earlier? I underwent orthopedic knee surgery, doctor. Can you brief me about your family history of diseases? All my family members have obesity, heart disease, and diabetes, and negative for hypertension and stroke. But I am using Chantix to come off smoking completely. Okay, tell me about your food habits. I eat things like bacon, eggs, and cheese, cheeseburgers, fast food. How many times do you eat in a day? I eat four times a day, 7 in the morning, at noon, 9 p.m., and 2 a.m. Well, the ideal weight for your age is 184 pounds, and you are weighing 344 pounds. That means 184 pounds in excess. What medications are you taking? Diovan, Crestor, and Tricor. Do you have any chest pains or any mild attacks? No, doctor. Well, your cranial nerves 2 through 12 are intact. Neck is soft and supple. You have positive wheezing bilaterally. Heart rhythm is normal. Abdomen is soft. You have one plus pitting edema. I have reviewed your complete test reports. This is a clear case of bariatrics and you need to go for a laparoscopic ruin y gastric bypass. The complications include infection, bleeding, pulmonary embolism, deep venous thrombosis, leakage from the gastrojejunal, anastomosis, and possible bowel obstruction. Before we proceed for the surgery, you need to get reports on upper endoscopy, H. pylori testing, thyroid function tests, LFTs, glycosylated hemoglobin, and fasting blood sugar. Okay, doctor. I would like to proceed with the surgery.
Extract 2, questions 13 to 24. You'll hear a physician talking to a patient called Mr. Andrews. For questions 13 to 24, complete the following notes with a word or short phrase. You now have 30 seconds to look at the notes. Good morning, doctor. Good morning. Please be seated. Is she your daughter? Yes, doctor. What's her name and what's her complaint? Her name is Tierra. She gets shortness of breath with vigorous play and exercise. She gets tired more quickly than the children of her age. Does she have coughing, wheezing, or chest congestion? No, doctor. What's her age? Six years old, doctor. Moreover, when she runs and races, she seems to have severe problems as it seems to take her a significantly long period of time to catch her breath. Was she admitted to any hospital earlier? No, doctor. She needed an apnea monitor after birth, and this was continued for approximately three months thereafter. At times, she has nasal congestions during the night and morning hours. What medications is she taking now? Nothing, doctor. Is she allergic to any medicine? No, doctor. Her immunizations are up to date? Yes, doctor, but she is yet to have influenza vaccine. While her pulmonary function test shows premature ventricular contraction, it is 1.21 liters, that is 77% of predicted. The FEV1 is 1.9, that is 81% of what we've predicted. Peak expiratory flow is 175 liters per minute, that is 82% of predicted. Post bronchodilator, she has no change in the forced vital capacity or FEV1. She had a 10% improvement in the peak expiratory flow up to 195 liters per minute. Her forced expiratory flow is 25 to 75% increased to 2.5 liters per second, which is a 28% improvement. Her borderline normal lung volumes is measured by the forced vital capacity and FEV1, and her flows are in the normal range, although there is some improvement seen post-bronchodilator. This would indicate that she has some airway reactivity. I have reviewed her recent chest x-ray. I have also reviewed the echocardiogram report, which shows normal. She has developed dyspnea with exertion, etiology unknown, maybe reactive airways disease, a potential cause. She has rhinitis, probably vasomotor and infectious. I am going to start albuterol HFA as pro-air and proventil two puffs via Inspir-Ease every four hours and 15 minutes prior to vigorous exercise. She can use either Claritin 10 mg or Zyrtec 10 mg daily for rhinitis symptoms, and she may also use Sudafed 30 mg every 6 hours for significant nasal congestion. Continue these medications for 2 months and meet me thereafter. Okay, thank you, doctor.
That is the end of Part A. Now look at Part B. Part B. In this part of the test, you will hear six different extracts. In each extract, you'll hear people talking in a different healthcare environment. For questions 25 to 30, choose the answer A, B, or C, which fits best according to what you hear. You will have time to read each question before you listen to the audio. Complete the answers as you listen to the audio. Now look at the question 25. You hear a discussion between a nurse and a physician explaining about ingredients used in a vaccine. Now read the question. Hello, doctor. Can you explain what ingredients are used in a vaccine? Well, chemicals used in a vaccine include a suspending fluid, such as sterile saline or fluids containing protein, preservatives such as glycine, albumin, and phenol, and enhancers or adjuvants to improve the effectiveness of the vaccine. Some vaccines may also contain trace amounts of the culture material for the growth of the virus or bacteria used in the vaccine, such as chicken egg protein. Even trace amount chemicals added to vaccines to deactivate a bacteria or virus and stabilize the vaccine and to keep the vaccine potent over time. Question 26. You hear a discussion between a nurse and a physician explaining about vancomycin-resistant enterococci. Now read the question. Hello, doctor. What are vancomycin-resistant enterococci? Vancomycin-resistant enterococci are particular types of antimicrobial-resistant bacteria that are resistant to vancomycin. This is often used to treat infections caused by enterococci. Enterococci are bacteria that are normally present in the intestines and in the female genital tract that are commonly found in the environment that can cause infections at times. Most of the times, vancomycin-resistant enterococci infections occur in hospitals. Often the infection is caused in patients with chronic diseases such as diabetes or who have recently received antibiotics. It's also more common in patients with indwelling devices like intravenous lines or urinary catheters and those with compromised immune systems. Vancomycin-resistant enterococci can cause many types of infections, such as urinary infection, heart infections called endocarditis, bloodstream infection called sepsis, abscesses, wound infections, pneumonia, or meningitis. The risk of vancomycin-resistant enterococci infection can be reduced by minimizing the use of indwelling devices, such as intravenous lines and urinary catheters. The risk can also be reduced by avoiding inappropriate use of antibiotics. Question 27. You hear a discussion between a nurse and a physician explaining about the causes of Shapara hemorrhagic fever. Now read the question. Doctor, how are the Shapara hemorrhagic fever is caused? A single-strand RNA virus called a Shapair virus of the Aranaviridae family causes Shapair hemorrhagic fever. Shapair virus is animal-borne or zoonotic infection. Limited clinical trial information about this infection in rural Bolivia. Like any other arenavirus, rodents host Shapair virus as a reservoir. Humans can contract this infection with a contact from an infected rodent. It can be direct 
or through inhalation or aerosolized Shapir virus from the feces or urine of infected rodents. Although there is a possibility of person-to-person -person transmission of arenaviruses through aerosolization, it's very rare. From the very limited observed cluster of cases of Shapir hemorrhagic fever, there was hardly any evidence of person-to-person -person transmission. Question 28. You hear a dialogue between two physicians discussing about teniasis. Now read the question. Hello, doctor. What is teniasis? Teniasis is a parasitic infection caused by the tapeworm species pork tapeworm or Tinea cilium, beef tapeworm or Tinea saginata, and Asian tapeworm or Tinea asiatica. Typically, people become infected with these tapeworms by eating raw or undercooked pork or beef. Often, individuals with teniasis infection may not know they have an infection because symptoms are non-existent or mild. Especially pork tapeworm infections can result in sister cirrhosis, a disease that can cause seizures. Question 29. You hear a monologue by a physician briefing about rickettsiosis. Now read the question. A group of diseases called spotted fever group rickettsiosis is called by closely related bacteria. Through the bite of infected ticks and mites, these bacteria spread to people. The most severe and commonly reported spotted fever group rickettsiosis is in the Rocky Mountain spotted fever. Other causes of spotted fever group rickettsiosis in the U.S. include rickettsia parkeri rickettsiosis caused by R. parkeri rickettsial pox caused by rickettsia acari, Pacific Coast tick fever caused by rickettsia philippi. Question 30. You hear a dialogue between two physicians discussing about health care associated infections. Now read the question. Doctor, what is the cause health care associated infections? Different types of healthcare associated infections, including pneumonia, wound, bloodstream infections, or surgical site infections, and meningitis caused by Klebsiella, is a type of gram negative bacteria. Increasingly, Klebsiella bacteria have developed antimicrobial resistance, and very recently, it has developed to the antibiotics called carbapenems. Normally, Klebsiella bacteria are found in the intestines, where they do not cause any disease. They are also found in feces. Commonly, Klebsiella infections occur among sick patients in healthcare settings, patients whose care needs devices such as ventilators or intravenous catheters. Moreover, patients taking long courses of certain antibiotics are at high risk for Klebsiella infections.
That is the end of Part B. Now, look at Part C. Part C. In this part of the test, you'll hear two different extracts. In each extract, you'll hear health professionals talking about specific aspects of their work. For questions 31 to 42, choose the answer A, B, or C, which fits best according to what you hear. Complete the answers as you listen to the audio. Now, look at Extract 1. Extract 1. Questions 31 to 36. You hear the discussion between a doctor and a nurse on the symptoms, signs, and causes of vulvovaginal candidiasis infection. You have 90 seconds to read the questions 31 to 36. Hello, doctor. Can you explain how vulvovaginal candidiasis infection occurs, its symptoms, and its treatment? Vulvovaginal candidiasis is a syndrome rather than an infection, and diagnosis of vulvovaginal candidiasis does not rely on clinical or laboratory criteria alone, but a combination of these two. Usually, vulvovaginal candidiasis is caused by C. albicans, but can occasionally be caused by other candida sp or yeasts. Typical symptoms of vulvovaginal candidiasis include vaginal soreness, pruritus, dyspareunia, abnormal vaginal discharge, and external dysuria. However, none of these symptoms are specific for vulvovaginal candidiasis. About 75% of women will have at least one episode of vulvovaginal candidiasis, and 40 to 45% will have two or more episodes. Based on clinical presentation, microbiology, host factors, and response to therapy, vulvovaginal candidiasis can be classified as either uncomplicated or complicated. About 10 to 20 percent of women will have complicated vulvovaginal candidiasis requiring special diagnostic and therapeutic considerations. Types of uncomplicated vulvovaginal candidiasis are sporadic or infrequent vulvovaginal candidiasis, mild to moderate vulvovaginal candidiasis, likely to be candida albicans on immunocompromised women, Complicated vulvovaginal candidiasis are recurrent vulvovaginal candidiasis. Several vulvovaginal candidiasis, non-albicans candidiasis, women with diabetes, immunocompromising conditions, debilitation, or immunosuppressive therapy. By the presence of symptoms such as external dysuria and vulvar pruritus, pain, swelling, and redness, a diagnosis of candida vaginitis is suggested clinically. Signs include fissures, vulvar edema, excoriations, and thick curdy vaginal discharge. The diagnosis can be made in a woman with signs and symptoms of vaginitis when either a gram stain or ret preparation of vaginal discharge demonstrates budding yeasts. 
pseudo hi-fi, hi-fi, or a culture, or other test yields a positive result for a yeast species. Use of 10% KOH preparation in wet preparations improves the visualization of mycelium and yeast by disrupting cellular material that might obstruct the visuality of yeast or pseudo hi-fi. Examination of a wet mount with KOH preparation should be performed for all patients with symptoms or signs of vulvovaginal candidiasis. For patients with negative wet mounts but existing symptoms or signs, vaginal cultures for candida should be considered. In case candida cultures cannot be performed, then an empiric treatment can be considered. Identifying candida by culture in the absence of signs or symptoms is not an indication for treatment, since approximately 20% of women harbor candida SP and other yeasts in the vagina. However, postcoital testing for yeast is not approved by Food and Drug Administration. Culture for yeast remains the gold standard for diagnosis. Vulvovaginal candidiasis can occur concomitantly with sexually transmitted diseases. Most healthy women with uncomplicated vulvovaginal candidiasis have no identifiable precipitating factors. Short course topical formulations effectively treat uncomplicated vulvovaginal candidiasis. The topically applied azole drugs are highly effective than nicotin. Treatment with azoles results in relief of symptoms and negative cultures in 90% of patients who complete therapy. Over-the-counter intravaginal agents clotrimazole, 1% cream, 5 grams intravaginally daily for 7 to 14 days, or clotrimazole, 2% cream, 5 grams intravaginally daily for 3 days, or myconazole, 2% cream, 5 grams intravaginally daily for 7 days, myconazole, 4% cream, 5 grams intravaginally daily for 3 days, or myconazole, 100 mg vaginal suppository, 1 suppository daily for 7 days, or myconazole, 200 gram vaginal suppository, 1 suppository for 3 days, or myconazole, 1200 mg vaginal suppository, 1 suppository for 1 day. Teoconazole, 6.5% ointment, 5 grams intravaginally in a single application. Prescription intravaginal agents, butoconazole, 2% cream, 5 grams intravaginally in a single application. Or terconazole, 0.4% cream, 5 grams intravaginally daily for 7 days. Or terconazole, 0.8% cream, 5 grams intravaginally daily for 3 days. Terconazole, 80 mg vaginal suppository, 1 suppository daily for 3 days. Oral agent, fluconazole, 150 mg orally in a single dose. Now, look at extract 2, questions 37 to 42. 
You hear the doctor giving a lecture on colon polyps and its treatment. You have 90 seconds to read questions 37 to 42. A colon polyp is a tiny growth of tissue projecting from the lining of a section of the large intestine called colon. Polyps are common and occurs as people age. Usually, colorectal polyps in the rectum or colon occur in 30% of adults above 50 years in the U.S., while in children, colorectal polyps occur with an estimated 6% affected to 12% in those who experience intestinal bleeding. Although most colon or bowel polyps are harmless, some polyps develop as cancer that takes many years to turn cancerous. The most common types of polyps are hyperplastic polyps and adentomatous polyps. Usually hyperplastic polyps or inflammatory polyps are harmless and not a cause for severe concern with a low malignant potential. Rarely these polyps become cancerous. Although adenomous or adenomatous polyps are not cancerous, they are potential enough to become cancerous in the future. Larger adenomous are more likely to become cancerous. Resection of adenomous polyps is usually recommended. Malignant polyps contain cancerous cells. The best treatment for malignant polyps will be based on the severity of the cancer and the overall health of the patient. The symptoms of colon polyps are Rectum bleeding is the most common symptom of polyps, though it can also be a sign of other conditions, such as minor tears in the anus or hemorrhoids. Large polyps that block the bowel movements partially can cause abdominal cramps and pain. Heavy bleeding from polyp can make the stool appear black, while minor polyp bleeding can cause red stripes in the stool. However, other factors such as medicines, foods, and supplements can also cause a change in the color of the stool. If a polyp bleeds slowly over time, it may cause an iron deficiency in the patients. Usually, iron deficiency, called anema, causes pale skin, weakness, shortness of breath, fainting, or lightheadedness. There may be a change in bowel movements lasting longer than a week, including diarrhea or constipation. Eating too much of red meat may cause the risk of colon polyps. Although etiology of colon polyps is not yet known, their occurrence may be connected with certain lifestyle factors such as a high-fat diet, eating too much red meat, not including adequate fiber in the diet, smoking, obesity. Genetic factors can also cause the colon cells to multiply over and above and form polyps in certain individuals. Certain individuals are more likely to develop colon polyps if they have inherited conditions, such as familial adenomatous polyposis, Gardner syndrome, or poots jagers syndrome. Colon polyps are usually removed by the following methods. In the colonoscopy procedures, a cutting instrument or an electrified wire loop on the end of a colonoscopy is used to perform a polypectomy. 
However, smaller polyps are raised and isolated from the surrounding area for easier removal by injecting a liquid underneath the polyp. In a laparoscopy, a small incision is made into the pelvis or abdomen. An instrument called a laparoscope is inserted into the bowel. This technique is used to remove very large polyps or if the polyps cannot be removed safely by colonoscopy. Removing the colon and rectum. In this procedure, called a proctocolectomy, is only performed when the patient has severe condition or cancer in which the colon and rectum are removed surgically. This method is suggested for patients with rare inherited conditions, such as familial adenomatous polyposis that causes cancer of the colon and rectum, and polyp removal may prevent further development of cancer. This is the end of Part C. You now have two minutes to check your answers.